hi there welcome back to the agostino zinga show with i your host agostino zinga and this is episode number 603 this is 603 of the agostino zinga show with i your host agostino zinga i hope this podcast finds you well wherever you may be wherever you may be damn guess what this is the third episode this week the third one I feel so proud of myself, man. I had a little goal in the back of my mind that I didn't really vocalize because I'm a big believer in action, speaking louder than words. And look what I did. I achieved it. If I can achieve it, just imagine what you could do. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But you know what I mean. Um, I'm, I am proud of myself, to be honest. Um, it's pretty difficult to get these things done because I work really late and I've got other things I do as well. So to kind of squeeze this time in to get it all recorded, put it all in, put it into YouTube, title it good, all this. Sort of, you know, it takes a while. So the fact that I did it and card at the time also proves something that I say quite often that, you know, the idea that people don't have time to do things is really a bit of a misnomer. Um, if you, you know, you always make time for the things you actually enjoy to do or the things that are kind of important to you and I feel like this is obviously important to me and I obviously did it so I'm happy about that little pat on the back little pat on the back but yeah apart from that gearing up for the weekend um, this will obviously be reaching your ears I think sometime on Friday so you should be having a good swell time listening to this before you head out for the weekend for the weekend or for the Friday night I'm probably going to be heading over to Fold um, to go and see DVS1 and Renee Wise playing I'm really looking forward to it um, I've heard a lot of good things about Renee Wise um, I actually missed them playing no what else yeah I actually missed him playing it in Berlin I think the weekend that I went I think they played I think he played them um, sorry the weekend before or something like that I forgot what it was and the reviews that I saw online especially from the Berg guy and flipping subreddit were absolutely phenomenal so I'm looking forward to that DVS1 I saw recently in E1 but I want to see him again in Fold because I think Fold that venue is going to be amazing to see DVS1 there so I'm really looking forward to that let me just get it up actually see if I can get up in here Tran, I think it's Transmissions right and it's at Fold so I'm really looking forward to seeing DVS1 play on that system over there because it's going to be absolutely wild he's going to absolutely tear the roof off of that place and I can't wait to come see it um, and obviously I think as well because of his um, links to Berlin and because of just him being a legend overall I think there's going to be a lot of real ravers out as well so I think they're going to make the rave too because the thing about London which is great is that we have some of the best sort of lineups we have some good clubs but the real good thing about London and the real bad thing about London is like a two-sided thing is that for the most part um, if there's not a good crowd at your party it's not going to go down well and if there is a good crowd at your party it doesn't matter about the sound system how crappy the venue is your party's going to go off so the crowds really do um you know dictate a lot of your kind of fun and because we don't have door picking we don't really have a you know we don't really have a door picking policy or kind of a thing that we do in the uk some promoters obviously do it but for the most part it's kind of like if you've got money you always get in so it kind of makes it difficult to kind of curate the space because that's where a lot of other places have the opportunity to do that obviously you know no better example than berlin they can actually curate their space and be a little bit more tight and strict about it because all they need to do is basically make sure whoops to get off the screen sorry all they need to do is is basically make sure that they're door picking properly at the door and everything kind of works out pretty fine but obviously here in london we don't really on the uk in general we don't really have that luxury so so people kind of have to just make do what they have and usually it's not the greatest so I'm hoping and I'm thinking that Devious One playing in such a small venue considering where he usually plays right because that guy's a pretty big time DJ and um, for him to play at a venue that's like a 500 capacity I think fold is or 750 around that mark is going to be banging it's going to be really good and of course like i said before I've, I've heard a lot of good things about renee wise so i'm really really curious to see how he's going to play too actually i might actually pull up a quick little clip on youtube and see um what i'm kind of expecting to hear when i go down there devious one i kind of know what i'm going to hear in terms of technical proficiency in terms of groove in terms of he, he does this really good thing where he's able to build his setup to a massive crescendo and he just rides it all the way until the end which is always great so i'm really looking forward to that but let me quickly have a little um little look see to see what renee wise's set will be like because i'll be curious to see what i'm kind of um be in store for what we do eventually go see him over there at the old fold happening soon so this is obviously him uh he played okay he did a set at hall what's this um one year ago celebrating 100 years of columbia oh i i've got that um mixtape sorry that album it's like a hundred tracks dip or something it was pretty good it came out last year there's some pretty big bangers on that actually to be honest um so this is him 
playing at whore I'm going to play it now and just kind of skip through and see if there's some bits on here that will be of you know of some sort of interest in terms of hearing what he's going to sound like one of my favorite techniques in DJing um the channel down channel up thing especially when you're mid mix it adds such a it adds such a great bit of layer layering sorry a little bit of oomph um dynamism to the tracks you're playing and just makes you sound so sick honestly it does it's such a good it's such a tiny little thing but it makes such a big difference especially when you're playing techno tracks and stuff man it really really does work let's play it here from here and see it here again Obviously, you know, I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah, transmission is happening later on tonight. So, I'm really looking forward to that. Cannot wait for that to kick off. So, I'm really, really looking forward to that. As you can see, um, it sold pretty well. All, all the tiers have currently sold out. They're currently on their fourth release. So, I'm assuming by the night's end, probably this will be completely sold. And there will be tickets available on the door. But Fold is pretty strict, though. I've, been at, I've, been, I've seen some nights at Fold where they say there's no more tickets at the door. Whatever they sold online is what they sold online. So, they get a bit strict with that sort of stuff. So, obviously, it shows that there's a big demand for these sort of nights but it's going to be banging man devious one already wise all night come on man it's going to be absolutely flames cannot cannot wait for it cannot cannot wait for it so i'm really looking forward to going to that um what has happened over the weekend oh i watched um once upon a time in london grad that's a pretty sick documentary about this uh property tycoon type guy called uh, scott young from the uk who was going through a messy divorce and you know um he was kind of, you know, I think it was maybe the longest divorce or saga in UK court history. I think it was like something like more than eight years or something. Um, his ex-wife was trying to get um, a hold of his assets and his money, but he kept kind of, you know, pretending that he was broke and didn't have any money. But then it kind of transpired that he actually didn't because he got involved in some shady deals with some Russians um, and some oligarchs and stuff. And, um, you know, and then, you know, out of the blue he ended up kind of falling out of his window um and the police kind of deemed it to be a suicide but his ex-wife said he would never would do that um and his kids didn't believe it either and then it kind of you know went and then i think that story was picked up from buzzfeed from an investigative journalist and that's where they basically start the documentary from and it's really good if you're into espionage if you're into um conspiracy theories for the most part or if you're just into just you know what's happening over there at russia because i'm i'm curious about that place it's a place i probably wouldn't ever visit but i'm just curious to kind of learn about it from the outside and you do get a kind of a weird spooky idea of the kind of influence um the russian government has over certain parts of other governments especially the uk and the police force here because for the most part every single death so far that's happened on british soil concerning a you know former russian sorry like a, a former a person that's kind of emigrated like to england from russia has been kind of you know brushed away as a suicide or whatever maybe there's not been treated suspicious which is obviously suspicious in itself because i think there's over five people that have died on uk soil who are kind of somewhat tied to oligarchs over there in russia so the fact that they never ever find anything wrong anything spooky about it is really really disturbing but i really do check i really do um what you call it i really do um recommend that you go and check it out it's called once upon a time in london grad and i really really enjoyed it i watched it actually on the plane back home i watched a bit of it as well the other day as well so i think i got one more episode to go but i think yeah i think one more episode to go. i think it's like five or six episodes so definitely recommend checking it out um if you're that way inclined loads of really good little bits of history knowledge there for you to kind of sink your teeth into and then I wanted to quickly kick off this, because I don't usually talk about football, first of all, but I wanted to kick off this off because I thought this is a really interesting topic and goes to kind of maybe speaks to a larger point concerning Man United. Obviously, you guys know, you know, I'm a big Man United fan and I'm kind of one of those United fans who doesn't really... Um, 
you know, who's not who's not really got their head in the clouds. I don't necessarily think because we've got a decent manager in Eric Ten Hag or because suddenly now the Glazers are, you know, backing, quote unquote, the manager, that things will suddenly change. I've always been the big believer that unless we get rid of the Glazers, unless the Glazers decide to sell, we're never going to be a club that challenges for the major trophies. The major trophies, I mean the Premier League, I mean the FA Cups, and I mean even the cha- yeah FA Cups even and the Champions League. Stuff like the League Cups and stuff, you can fluke and whatever it may be, but those three major trophies especially the league you don't win them unless you are a well-run club unless you're a well old machine unless you do things the right way especially nowadays i think back in the day you could co- probably get away with it especially if you're a bigger club like united you could basically just throw your checkbook at most clubs and get their best players and whatever it may be and you didn't really face much competition but nowadays the smaller clubs can hold on to their players far longer they can demand a fire a far higher fee sometimes the players aren't super um, aren't super infused about going to these big clubs anyway because it doesn't mean they're going to play look what's happening with flipping um, what's his name Jack Grish at, at Man City he still hasn't necessarily settled there even though he was you know a record British transfer and whatnot. so all these things kind of play into it and I've always kind of come I've always been of the thinking that again unless we get rid of the Glazers or they sell we won't be successful in any way shape or form um, but also one of the major things I think has been a real kind of um horrendous sort of legacy of the Glazers is just generally how poorly we're run as a club and I think the kind of the the lack of accountability and the kind of mickey taking the, the players do to at that club because a lot of these players are rewarded with new contracts they shouldn't get rewarded for they stay at the club for far longer than they should be they're basically forced on some managers in order to play and I think it breeds a culture of entitlement so as much as I despise Harry Maguire as a person from what he's presented of himself so far part of me also thinks it's not his fault he's kind of been enabled to get away with he's kind of been enabled to do the things that he does because the club doesn't necessarily stamp it out they kind of let everybody kind of run a mock, especially if you're a high profile player, you can get away with pretty much anything if you want at United. And one of the things that, of course, surprised a lot of people that was kind of trending on Twitter for what the last couple of days, um, Harry Maguire or a source close to Harry Maguire decided to speak to Mark Ogden, a prominent sort of a journalist who covers a lot of stuff concerning Manchester and Man City and Man United. And basically decided to throw his teammates under the bus um, and basically blame everyone but himself for the fact that he's not been starting at United anymore, right? Um, because obviously Eric Ten Hag made some changes after the Brentford loss and decided to go with um, Rafa Varane and um, Martinez in, in the, in the, as a defensive pairing. And since then, Harry Maguire hasn't really had a looking since. And when he has played, he's looked very, very shaky. But in general... Um, it's not really again his fault he's not as good as you know the price tag would make you believe I dev- he never was probably that good anyway so it obviously proved that we kind of overpaid for him as we usually do um, we're the only club that gets taxed on transfers I think every other club can manage to secure a play pretty well but I think even if imagine if Man United tried to buy Jack Grealish I think we would have definitely paid more than 150 for him but Man City managed to get him for 100 million so there's something messed up with our negotiation that obviously affects the way that we kind of go into these deals and then we end up overpaying for players and then some players can't handle the pressure of the price tag and I think I said from the very beginning that I think the price tag for Harry Maguire really kind of skewed the perception of him as a player because I don't think he's that bad but I also think if you're going to be bought for 80 million people people want to see 80 million's worth of quality if they don't see it they're going to keep mentioning a price tag so there are a lot of people online who are kind of defending Maguire and saying oh he's not his fault he didn't make the price no yeah he didn't but now he has to rise to a challenge and unfortunately so far he just hasn't done it especially since more competition has come in which is probably a a worse sort of indication of him as a person because it's one thing playing okay when there's no other options around and you're the only person that's always fit and you play because that's one thing you have to rate Harry Maguire for yeah he rarely gets injured and he was always available to play whenever called upon but it does say a lot about him as a person that at the first point of real competition for his place in the team instead of fighting for his place or wanting to go on loan and prove himself like Eric Bailly he did he just kicked you know threw his toys out of the pram and now he's leaking stories to the press and stuff it's quite disgusting but anyway during the international break Harry Maguire decided to leak some stuff to Mark Ogden and it says the following this is an article Mark Ogden wrote that says can Harry Maguire rescue his England World Cup hopes in a career defining week it's um, and it continues 
Harry Maguire is at the beginning of his biggest week of his career. Main United captain has two games for England against Italy and Germany in UEFA's National Nations League sorry, over the next seven days that will shape his season and show whether he can emerge from his nightmare 12 months for a club and country. At 29, the world's most expensive defender, Maguire eclipsed Virgil van Dijk when completing his 80 million move from Leicester City to United in 2019. Only 2019. And he's already looking like he's surplus of requirements. Honestly, our recruitment in our club is horrendous, right? We buy a player for 80 million only in 2019 and he's already, you know, depreciated his value considerably. He looks a shell of his former self and I don't really know who we could offload him to if we wanted to. So we might be stuck with him for a long time. Anyway, it continues. He has reached a crossroads in his career. There's been pre- pre- um, precious little good news at United in recent months with injury and loss of form costing Maguire his first team plays. But despite this fall from grace at Old Trafford, England manager Gareth Southgate has kept faith with one of the most reliable performers. Let's not forget that just over a year ago, Maguire was earned his place in UEFA team of 2020 after a standing tournament in which England reached the finals and came within the penalty shootout of winning the first major competition since 1966 the former Sheffield United and Hull City centre back <laughs> he hasn't got much to his name in it just playing for Sheffield United Hull City and Leicester and a couple of relegations but nothing else to show for it um, which also is, you know goes to show like you know his ego must be incredible because he doesn't hasn't won anything and he already thinks he's big time Charlie anyway um, he was also a key figure in return to the semi-finals of the 2018 World Cup and although he's booed by a small section of England supporters during the Wembley friendly against Ivory Coast in March, Southgate condemned the fans' reaction as an absolute joke. Um, the alarming state of United's career, of his United career, has perfectly illustrated by his emergence um, from the substitute bench in the 90th minute of last Tuesday's Europa League game against FC Sheriff in Moldova, having been partly blamed for the defensive chaos which led to the defeats against Brighton and Brentford in the opening two games of the season. Maguire now can't even persuade their manager Eric Ten Hag to trust him in the Europa League game against the champions of Moldova. There's no question that Maguire's future for the club and country is now shrouded in uncertainty and losing an England place will only make it tougher for him to get back to where he needs to be but he is in the middle of a remarkable downward spiral. He's actually lucky that Gareth Southgate is so loyal to the players that have done him so well in tournaments. He doesn't necessarily... That's the thing with Gareth Southgate. It's a bit weird to kind of get around because I think in, with some players it's about club form, but with other players it's about what he's basically seen in them and how they perform for him in other tournaments. So you know you can rely on them. So he has this weird kind of double standard. So some players get picked on club form, some players don't get picked on club form. No, some players don't get picked because of their club form, but the other players just get picked because they played well in the twenty eighteen, you know, tournament, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. It's just just doesn't make any sense really but Harry Maguire is lucky because I think if he wasn't getting picked for England and wasn't getting picked for United his situation would be perilous do you know what I mean really really would be um, until the 79th minute of United's um, league win against Aston Villa in May 2021 little had gone wrong for Maguire okay let's go to the quotes um, the quotes are the interesting thing da 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 yeah, it's the one. Maguire has become a lightning rod for the fans' frustration with the captain struggle to justify the armband or position of the team and the situation has deteriorated with the point where he's now regarded as many as the central factor of defensive problems at United. Um, has Ten Hag identified the problem and dealt with it by dropping Maguire favoring the defensive partnership of Rafael Varane and Lissandra Martinez or is Maguire simply a victim of circumstance? Now, this is the leak that got leaked to Mark Ogden. This is as follows. Harry needs pace around him, but he hasn't had that, a source close to Maguire told ESPN. If you put Man City's Ruben Diaz in United's defence and Harry in City's back four, Diaz would struggle and Harry would thrive. Harry hasn't had a good 12 months, but he hasn't had been helped by those around him, coaches or players, so it's inevitable that his confidence and form have suffered. Absolutely shocking, right, to say this in the first place. And also, the lack of, like, courage, the cowardice in this is at an all-time high because I'm not I'm kind of controversial here because I don't really mind it when players throw their toys out of the prime especially ones that aren't playing because at least it shows you care I think players like you know again I mention him all the time but someone like a Phil Jones who you hardly hear say anything unless he's you know he was getting you know insulted by Rio on the, on the stream and he came out said something and then he put out this flipping sob story thing in the Guardian to people to respect his and whatever but for the most part Phil Jones has basically kept his mouth shut went to training and kept collecting his check he has no desire to play football clearly right so that is something that i despise of of course because you know i support the club but obviously as a as i'm human i can understand why he's doing it but as a supporter of the club i hate to see someone just taking up a space in the squad or a space at the club in general and not you know obviously playing whatever it may be and there's no kind of chance of us being able to get rid of him but with the harry Maguire thing the thing that makes this really strange is that 
it's only a few games into the season. I think it might be five. And he's already throwing his toys out the pram, but he also doesn't have the guts to say it with his chest. He's not saying this himself. He's kind of passed it on to a representative, an agent, a friend to go and send it anonymously or whatever, however they do it to Mark Ogden to write up. He hasn't been brave enough to say it out loud. And, you know, at least Eric Bailly did. He said it on his way out, but at least he's kind of spoke about his frustrations about saying that, oh, he feels like when he was at United and Oligan Solskjaer was there, he was preferring only playing British players or playing players based on reputation alone and not allowing other players a chance to go into the team, which kind of bred a real bad culture in a dressing room because it meant certain players didn't matter how poorly they played the game or how you know poorly they performed in training they were always going to get picked because the manager kind of favored them so that's something that he kind of complained about but he said it with his chest Maguire here saying it for a representative so obviously that's something that I'm not rating at all then this assertion that somehow he's like because he says here right if you or whoever is next to him said if you can if you put Man City's Ruben Diaz in United's defense and Harry Maguire in City's back defense Diaz will struggle and Harry would thrive this is kind of in a weird roundabout way comparing Harry Maguire to Ruben Diaz and there's they're no way comparable Ruben Diaz is an actual good defender he may have his weaknesses here and there but overall he's a really good defender well-rounded can cover the ground really really well is strong in the air good at tackling can play a high line can play deep like can cover all all bases for the most part and the other thing that's really amazing about him is that despite all the sort of quote-unquote leaders in that man city dressing room he's still the captain sometimes right he uh, yeah if, i think he's good in us are playing but i think he's definitely the captain if i'm not mistaken so he's been able to command that changing room even though he came in pretty late compared to the other players shows the character that he has right the temperament of that player so to compare yourself to him is really, really insane in the most part. And then also to say that because the circumstances haven't been perfect, that's why you've been playing. May not have been a complete mess for the last 10 years. No one's had great circumstances. I think even Paul Pogba could really have a decent argument for saying that he didn't show his best for United because the promises that he was made about United, you know, wanting to make him the, you know, the player they kind of build their team around were never really followed through until maybe he left really. It was where we kind of followed through and actually signed some decent players that you put Paul Pogba into this current midfield that we have now at the moment and he looks a far better player. Of course, he's injured at the moment, but you know what I mean. So he has a reason to say it, but Harry Maguire probably doesn't. Defence has always been maybe, I think, one of our strongest points, especially centre-back. We've always had decent bodies. Not the best, but we've had decent enough bodies where you could maybe say, hey, these players are good enough to get to a certain level. And for the most part, the reason why Harry Maguire should be worrying is that the defence hasn't looked good overall, but the really bad thing for him is that he's looked especially bad his own personal performances have been bad and that's what you don't see here you don't see any accountability of saying hey obviously my performances haven't been up to scratch you just see him blaming everybody else it continues sources have said that Maguire's frustration with goalkeeper David De Gea's communication and reluctance to defend further away from his goal line will also factor in the overall malaise in the 90 defence last season that issue has been improved by Argentina defender of Martinez rival from Ajax and his ability to communicate in, communicate with and has shocked their game in Spanish this is legitimately bordering on xenophobia because if I'm not mistaken, David De Gea has been at the club for more than 10 years, right? Um, he basically speaks English with a fucking Mancunian accent, even though he's Spanish because he's obviously, you know, he spent most of his time in Manchester, especially his adulthood or you know, young man into his adulthood and whatnot. He speaks perfectly good English. He's only he's one of the only players actually who comes out and fronts interviews with the press when we have a poor performance. He's actually, you know, quite scathing and maybe throws his players on the bus for some, you know, in some bits and pieces here and there. And maybe he's been fired by the club behind the scenes, but for the most part, he speaks very well. He gives interviews without any help no translator um he doesn't need you know people to repeat questions to him he's very fluent in speaking english so the fact that harry Maguire is blaming david de gea's spanishness on the reason why he's not been playing well is absolutely insane but it's also a clever play for him because david de gea hasn't has hasn't had the best what last few seasons for at united his standards have maybe dropped people have been calling for his head he's not the best you know defender with his feet he doesn't really def you know play well to you know behind the high line he doesn't come on his box the best so maybe saying these kind of things is good because you know fans actually aren't necessarily sold on the gear and think that he should be sold so you can easily blame him but god almighty again the lack of accountability from this guy is absolutely on another level um and then of course off the back of that um this story came out that essentially alleged that mark ogden might have made up the entire story himself because he said sources which is quite funny that nowadays it feels like 
football journalists can't get away with just saying whatever. I think because of football Twitter and because of social media in general, fans are on journalists' heads and stuff. And if they get stuff wrong, they get reminded of it forever and ever and ever. And if they just make stuff up or they don't, you know, yeah, they don't, not say provide sources, but they don't indicate that maybe this is a legit story. Fans just keep going at them, going at them. So I guess the pressure was too much. And also there was news that, or something got leaked, that Eric Ten Hag's team, wanted to contact Mark Ogden and find out if that actually did come from Harry Maguire's team because if it did he was obviously going to be really pissed because if I'm not mistaken there was a story I remember reading that um, Eric Ten Hag is a pretty fair manager in that he understands play frustration but one of the main things he doesn't tolerate is players and agents going to the press to kind of voice their frustrations and disrupt the harmony of the dressing room and whatnot he's like the kind of guy that's like hey my door's always open having not come in and speak to me about your frustrations about not playing about not getting enough minutes about not being included in squads whatever your issue is not having a new contract whatever it is but don't go to the press of it because if you go to the press of it you're going to upset the whole harmony of the group so it's, it's kind of like a you know a law that he has a rule so i can imagine how pissed off he must be for his captain someone that he said will still be captain too like he put faith in him he played him a few matches obviously it didn't work out but he still was somebody that kind of had his back you can assume how mad he's going to be so I've, i heard that you know or i read online actually that he was going to reach out to mark Gordon's team and find out if it did actually come from him and i guess you know the pressure was put on him or i guess maybe harry Maguire's team said something and this is the development so far regarding the story. This is Mark Ogden talking on ESPN about it. Diaz would struggle and Harry would thrive. Harry hasn't had a good 12 months, but he hasn't been helped by those around him. Let's welcome in, shall we, Mark Ogden first. And Mark, can you just confirm the source close to Harry Maguire isn't Harry Maguire? <laughs> it's not Harry Maguire, no. Despite what <laughs> social media seems to think today. Harry Maguire hasn't <laughs> phoned me up. So, uh, yeah, let's put that one straight right away. Has he got a point, Mark, your source? Well, I think so. I mean, look, I mean, he does stress in there that Harry Hales had a great time, hasn't had a great time the last 12 months, and he's had a terrible start to the season. I'm not for one minute suggesting that Harry Maguire should be back in the United team or in the England team, but I do think that the players around Harry Maguire, certainly last season... I'm not suggesting. You hear what he said there? So maybe he just made up the story himself. I don't really know. But one thing for me that makes it true, I think, is the fact that we haven't heard anything so far from Harry Maguire personally and his team. They haven't come up and or come out and clarified anything. They haven't set the record straight. No kind of vague statements, zero. It's been absolute cricket. So clearly it was something that Harry Maguire said. And I guess now he's going to face the consequences of it. And I think in general, if you're Eric Ten Hag, you have to put your foot down and lay the law and basically strip him of his captaincy just to kind of send a message to the team that no one's above reproach. That kind of, you know, kind of attitude or that kind of way of thinking or that kind of way of talking and acting will just not be tolerated. But the concerning thing is if he doesn't get stripped of his captaincy, that we know who's in charge at United, really. We know the Glazers are really in charge and managers are just kind of, cust you know, temporary custodians or whatever it may be. Um, but the real owners, the real kind of bosses in charge are Richard Arnold and all these kind of American cronies. That's what happens. So I'm hoping he does get stripped of his captain just to send a message. Obviously, you know, him going to moan to the press isn't new. Players do it all the time. And if anything, United are basically, you know, breeding this environment where players can get away with whatever they want. But, you know, going forward, we're going to need to have some discipline. We're going to need to people kind of you know not doing those kind of things going forward because we want to get to bigger and higher places and we can't be having people just saying whatever it is now we just can't we just can't um rolling on from that let's continue and go into some other news here this is courtesy of bbc have you guys seen this this is pretty bleak so obviously you know what's happening over in ukraine right um and i guess uh putin earlier made a had a press conference where he essentially said he might be trying to enlist um you know russian citizens to go fight in a war in ukraine and then other people analyzing it are basically saying that this is obviously a kind of roundabout admission from the russian government that they probably are not winning um that war and that they're basically losing their grip and they have to kind of you know call for reinforcements and look at this this is courtesy of bbc it says ukraine war russians flee to the border after military call-up imagine um these are all the cars and traffic right heading to the border it says queues have sprung up along russia's border as men attempt to leave the country to avoid military call-up for the war in ukraine and you would imagine russian men even if they're pussies russian men in general on average are probably some of the hardest guys out there right pretty cold uh you know pretty matter of fact no waft no kind of fat on their bones you know straight 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 to your guts type people right 
So if someone like that in that kind of country can be scared and worried and not wanting to go into the war, just imagine how terrifying it must be to be called up in general. You know, just a regular dude, you're a butcher, you work as a mechanic, you're a postman, you have no job, and suddenly now they want you to get hold of an AK-47 and go and kill people that you don't even know, people that you don't even care for in the most part. You haven't really thought about it in any way, shape or form. Maybe you've got even family members out there in Ukraine, and now suddenly you're meant to kind of be, turn, you're meant to turn yourself into a soldier, in, you know, in a around about what two weeks or something it's absolutely crazy they continue to the president Vladimir Putin announced a partial military mobilization on Wednesday, which could see 300,000 people summoned to serve in the war. The Kremlin says the report of fighting aged men fleeing are exaggerated. Of course, they'll say that. I love the, you got to love the Kremlin. And you see the actual images, right? The actual videos of people here fleeing to the border. But the Kremlin said it didn't happen. You got to love it. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. But look, all these cars. This is a camera going through the cars that are just, you know, piling up on the roads. You see, we just see our brake lights everywhere. And just cars spiraling, spiraling, spiraling everywhere. Amazing. Um, it continues. Um, but on the border with Georgia, uh, miles long queues of, the, of vehicles have formed, including men trying to escape the war. One man who did not want to be named told BBC's Ryan Dimitri he had grabbed his passport and headed to the border without packing anything else. Jesus. And immediately after President Putin's announcement, because he fell into the group that could potentially be sent to war. Some witnesses estimate the queue of cars in the upper last checkpoint to be uh, three miles long, while another group said it had taken seven hours to get across the border. Video of the scene showed some drivers leaving their cars or trucks temporarily in standstill traffic. Georgia is one of the few neighboring countries in Russia uh, that Russians can enter without needing to apply for a visa. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Finland, which shares a 800-mile um, border with Russia, does, does require a visa for travel and also reported an increase in traffic overnight, but said it was manageable. Okay, so people are going to Finland and Georgia. Those are two very different countries, isn't it? Um, both, like, you know, politically, uh, socially, religiously, everything. Like, two very, very different countries. Other destinations reachable by air, such as Istanbul, Belgrade, or Dubai. I have seen ticket prices skyrocket immediately after the military call-up was announced and some destinations sold out completely. Turkish media have reported a large spike in one-way ticket sales while remaining flights to non-visa destinations can cost thousands of euros. Germany's interior minister signaled on Thursday that Russians fleeing the draft would be welcomed in her country. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. So Nancy Fraser said the deserters threatened by severe um Nancy Fraser, sorry, said deserters threatened by severe rep repressions would receive protection on case-by-case -case basis following security checks lithuania latvia estonia and czech republic struck a different tone saying they would not offer fleeing russians refuge so absolutely jesus look at that headline i will break my arm and my leg anything to avoid the draft yeah i always had aspirations of being in the army when i was younger i think i told my parents i wanted to be in it and they completely told me i couldn't under any circumstances i legitimately was kind of wanting to go into the cadets and eventually you know become uh, you know, just become part of the army and stuff and fight and whatnot. I had the kind of fanciful idea of it, but the more you look at these kind of things, the more I'm kind of grateful that that dream did not come true, mate, because God almighty, number one, I probably would have been used to say it, and number two, you know, the, the psychological damage it could do to you, and obviously the risk of you not actually coming home is absolutely incredible. But just imagine, man, just imagine, just imagine. A war that these guys didn't want in the first place, right? Regular Russian citizens. Obviously, there are going to be some Putin lovers out there, but for just imagine regular people who just minding their business, going to work and whatnot, and then suddenly they're being called up into a war that they did not sanction, they did not vote for, they did not endorse in any slightest way. And they're going to go from being just regular folks, regular guys, and then suddenly now you're, you've been told to go and kill people. Cold-blooded. <sighs> I, can, I can only imagine. Anyway, changing tact, we've got here news courtesy of The Verge, which is absolutely amazing for me, obviously on this platform that I'm, you can view me on, which is the following. YouTube will let creators monetize videos with licensed music. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. It says as follows. Um, YouTube is making, is working on a new program to let creators monetize their long-form videos that use licensed music. At its... Um, made on youtube event today the company announced creator music opening up a catalog of popular music for creators to use in their videos without getting monetization dinged creators have few options they can either license tracks directly and keep all the revenue besides the 45 percent youtube takes or share revenue with license holders if creators opt to share the revenue their 55 percent share will be proported based on the number of license tracks in the video youtube spokesman susan kardesha says um if they use one track they'll keep 2.27 
12.5%. If they use two, they'll have 18.3%. Visas are subject to other deductions, like performance rights, fees, and remaining portions go to the holders. It's been really cool. Honestly, it's a really cool feature because if you're not aware, uh, most YouTubers can't use licensed music because for you know copyright issues and whatnot. And sometimes with music, licensed music, it gets blocked. Like I know for me, sometimes I've been like, you know, I don't care. I want to put some licensed music into this little vlog that I did. And sometimes YouTube just won't let you, it won't be viewable to anybody because whoever made the music doesn't allow it or whether it's their label or whatever it may be. So it kind of really makes it difficult for you to kind of include stuff that is current in, in your videos. And then all you have to use is kind of licensed free music, which isn't the best. But obviously over the years, because they've been so strict with all this, um, you know, um, with all this flipping licensed music stuff the unlicensed music quality has really improved over the years before it was horrible like you only have to look at somebody like a uh, Casey Neistat look, watch some of his earlier vlogs and the music was terrible but you watch some of his later vlogs um, the unlicensed music the, uh, the unlicensed music to become a lot better because people had to rely on it because there was nothing else that you could use but to have this op avenue option so to have this um this avenue open up is really cool because what it does do is obviously allows YouTubers to be a little more creative in the stuff that they use in music wise, but it also allows the opportunity for YouTubers to highlight people and to kind of shine lights on people that, you know, maybe you haven't heard of, maybe you play a track from somebody and you never heard a track before you hear it in a vlog and suddenly now you're following that person, you become their biggest fan, you go to the show, you buy their merch. Um, maybe it's just going to be a way for maybe for musicians and YouTubers to collaborate on different projects. It just opens up a whole bevy of opportunities for people but in general for the viewer it does make it far more interesting because now youtubers can actually have music that's far more interesting maybe speaks more to the topic that they're speaking about maybe sets the tone better for what they're showing on video loads of things can open up but i really do think it's a positive all around for everybody involved um obviously the monetization part of it's amazing but i think creatively just to have the option to have it be able to be playable is something that i'm definitely going to explore because i know i've got many videos on my channel that got completely blocked so even some mixes and whatever that i did before that i couldn't even restream on flipping youtube or upload because you know whoever owned the rights to it kind of blocked um anybody else being able to display it on their channel so having this option is definitely something that i'm going to be exploring going forward so yeah youtube are um going to now let people have their licensed music um, and monetize it as well there's not a date set on it at the moment um I don't see a date on there, but soon I guess we're going to be able to see it. So I'm really, really okay here. Um, the beta, the, the program is in beta uh, in the US and will expand to other countries next year. So hopefully we'll see it within the next year or so. So it's going to be a big, big change and definitely it's going to, I think, um, improve the quality of everyone's streams. Everyone's not on the streams, but everyone's kind of videos on YouTube going forward. Um, I'm eager to see how people creatively kind of, you know, interpret all that stuff and mix it into their content. It's going to be absolutely banging. I can't wait. Next on list here, we've got news courtesy of Good Morning America featuring the one and only Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, sitting down with them and talking about all things parenting, Kardashians, fatherhood, Donder Academy and more. And there's some cool clips on here that I want to kind of focus on, but let's just play this one and we're going to go through some of the things that Kanye said because I thought some of the stuff was absolutely hilarious. First things first though, visually, I'm feeling the beard. I really am feeling the beard. I'm feeling him kind of really leaning into this sort of uh, nomad lighting that he has going on. I think he mentioned in the interview, I think it was with um, Drink Champs. He said something like, oh, he just like basically goes and sleeps in people's houses now his friends couches or whatnot stays in various apartments here and there you know travels with just one bag doesn't necessarily change his clothes too often wears the same sort of stuff again and again and again and all of it is to kind of focus on his creativity right to kind of wear this uniform um to kind of go into this new stage of his life whatever it may be but i just love it in terms of visually um it has changed up what he looks like and maybe hopefully it will change his perspective and opinions of some things that i think are pretty funny and dumb but that's play the clip anyway this is the first clip of it says here yay apologizes to kim kardashian opens up about co-parenting challenges let's play this this is the mother of my children and i apologize for any stress that i have caused even in my frustration because god calls me to be stronger but also ain't nobody else gonna be causing no stress either i 
it's hilarious, right? He's finally apologizing to this lady. And again, I have no time for that Kardashians in general. I think they're a scourge on humanity. Um, I don't necessarily have a problem with their show, but just think of them as a family and what they promote, um, you know, and the kind of kids that kind of, you know, look up to them. It's just a toxic and dangerous relationship. But again, none of my business. But there's no denying that he did overstep the mark a lot of times, right? He publicly insulted the guy that she was seeing. He depicted him dying in music videos he essentially called um you know kim's mum a pimp um he called the sisters prostitutes like many 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 really insulting things that you'd think sometimes you know there'd be no coming back from but of course if you have kids with a person there always has to be that door open because unfortunately he is also the kid's father so he has to play some role in their family so you have to kind of make it somewhat um cordial but he has said a lot of crazy stuff about Kim in the public. And so far, she's basically kept her mouth quiet. Yes, there have been some leaks to the press in terms of making him look a bit crazy and saying certain things. But for the most part, they've kept it pretty tight as a family when it comes to dealing with Kim and Kanye. Maybe it's because they don't know how to deal with him. But I think in general, they've kind of let him kind of spiral and do what he wants in the, in the public and just kind of kept everything behind closed doors in terms of what they were doing. So but to him to now turn around and say what he's saying is funny because I always got the impression from what he was saying i think i said in the podcast myself i got the impression from how he was ranting that he genuinely didn't like kim as a person which is funny because you know he had four kids with a lady he was chasing her for flipping ages there was that whole story that they said or they, they were spinning when they first got together that kanye was always in love with her from the beginning but they were never kind of they were never both single at the same time and all this sort of like you know romantic stuff but now it kind of looks weird because Kanye was basically acting or speaking about her as if like she was some random fuck he met in a club when clearly you know she wasn't and also he kind of met her knowing everything about her so the fact that he went to sort of like weirdly change who she was as a person really didn't really add up to me or make any sense but I just find it hilarious that now he's finally like in a weird way, now that he's finally kind of got his way, he's now kind of wanting to be more apologetic and stuff going forward. This is absolutely hilarious, man. I need this person to be least stressed and a best sound <laughs> mind and as calm as possible to be able to raise those children. Do you feel you have a voice as you're co-parenting now? I do have a voice, but I had to fight for it. That hurts you when you, when you have to like scream about what your kids are wearing. And it's just little nuances where there was a parallel to what was, what was happening at Gap, what was happening at Adidas, and what was happening in my home. It was all a, a kind of a disregard for the voice of something that I co-created. I co-created the children. I co-created the product at Adidas. I co-created the product at Gap. It's funny that he's talking about his children and the products in the same sentence but anyway we move what i find funny as well about kanye in general um especially the more you start to you know i think the older you get i'm again i'm a huge fan of the guy but i think when i was younger i was more wrapped up in the standom of him um in general and maybe i didn't really have any other restaurant players in terms of people doing crazy amazing inspiring things in the arts and whatnot and fashion design and music but one thing you notice about him is that He's always had issues with corporations that he's worked with, with brands he's worked with. He's always had issues with, you know, promoters and festivals and whatever it may be, right? Talk shows and whatever it may be. And people, and even this situation now, right? With Gap and Adidas, and obviously now with the Kardashians of the family overall, it never quite comes to, it never springs in his head the idea that maybe his own communication style is the reason why he's into, he's always has these issues. Like he had to scream and shout about it, Corey got his way, but couldn't there have been, isn't there, a, isn't there like some sort of, um, could it also be argued that maybe at the beginning there was a lack of communication or clear communication, effective communication that resulted in having to go to the shouting route? Like, couldn't you just avoid shouting and maybe just spoke, you know, in a, um, clear way in a sensible way in a mature way that would allow you to have the opportunity to kind of say your piece in terms of how you feel your kids should be raised maybe i don't know but the fact that that never crosses your mind is funny because he always thinks he's always the victim right he's always the champion always the victor always wins 
always going to be successful but then he's always also the victim that like everyone's always doing him wrong which is like a weird way to look about things i guess it's different because maybe he's the one being asked a question so obviously he's not going to look at it from the other point of view but i just find it interesting how he never comes to the conclusion that maybe if he's having all these issues with different people people like gap people like adidas um his own family maybe the common denominator there is you kanye but he doesn't think like that there's a parallel and the parallel does touch on discrimination even within your marriage <laughs> yeah well, how this man thinks he's discriminated by the connections a whole family of women who you know have made it very clear that they only date black men he feels he's discriminated by them <laughs> Discriminate by Adi, that's a company that I don't know, you can't really say that Adi, that's not racist, you can't really say Gap are racist either because they just went clout and you know, whatever it may be, and you know, virality and you know, sellouts online and shit. And you happen to be one of the coolest people in the world, you make great clothes, so they just you know, they tapped you up, and obviously, you're interested in a brand, so they kind of collaborate with you. Discrimination is fucking hilarious. <laughs> How do you move forward now in the fashion industry when they're saying you can't even not only show Yeezy products, but anything bearing that likeness? Oh, we got some new lawyers. We really had to level up and show them, really show them who's, you know, who's the new boss in town. He now plans to sell the Yeezy brand directly to consumers, something he argued about with radio host Sway back in 2013. Or why don't you empower yourself and don't hmm. need them and do it yourself? Ha, like Sway. You take a few steps back to go. You ain't got the answers, work. man. So Sway, almost 10 years ago, said, man, why don't you do it on your own? Was he right? You know what? I will go ahead and say Sway had the answer. Mm. I know people are going to be like, no. <laughs> so social. So, yeah. That's the funny and frustrating part of it, isn't it? And I actually guessed that. I think I tweeted that a while back, maybe a couple of days ago, that maybe Sway did have the answers when I saw these kind of clips of him raging about production and not being happy with what's happening at, at Gap and whatnot. It was pretty clear at that time, maybe, that Sway maybe wasn't right at that moment because what Kanye was talking about in terms of him bringing up Stella McCartney and about production when it comes to fashion stuff, there's clearly something to be had for being linked up with those production companies right or those manufacturers right whatever it may be because they're able to produce or your you know clothes at a really high level and they're able to kind of really um manufacture your vision right they're able to kind of get it out there make it look the way it's meant to look presented to a certain level and you, you and unfortunately all those things are kind of you know they're behind closed doors they're not for the public you can't necessarily google these places they're things that need to be kind of introduced to and whatever it may be behind the scenes blah 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 so all that screaming and shouting did help because it essentially took easy from looking really ragtag to looking how it looks now which looks really polished really clean you might not like you know the kind of aesthetic but you can't deny that the quality of easy clothing is really really good um so clearly it did help but the overall message that sway was sending or was trying to kind of relate to kanye at the time was that you should also be looking eventually to get to a point where you just do it on your own because clearly you're the guy that's special you're the one that has the great idea so if that's the case why not just cut out the middleman and just sell directly to consumers or kind of empower yourself to maybe start small not just have a whole line of stuff and then kind of build up incrementally over the time but you know Kanye didn't want that he was infatuated with those brands and those big conglomerates LVMH caring all this sort of stuff talking about what Disney all this sort of stuff you know the kind of white man obsession thing he had going on and eventually you know it, it led him to get bit in his hand or bit in his bum and now he's kind of back with his tail between his legs basically saying you know what maybe you guys are right but the good thing is that he has a bucket load of cash he has loads of resources he has a great team around him and all this experience so clearly i still think he will still end up succeeding because you know he succeeded already in spite of all the hurdles he had just imagine or he's had obviously during the time just imagine now with all the experience he's had and all this profile is gained da, 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 he's definitely going to be doing good things going forward so i think this next evolution of what he is going to be is going to be probably his best stuff ever i think going forward definitely definitely going to be and it's probably going to change the industry overall going forward and like i said in another podcast even though i'm not a fan of some of the stuff the guy talks about or how he kind of goes about it 
I do also understand that he needs to be that guy that says this type of stuff that kind of is willing to say the uncomfortable truths, who's willing to be this open, be this kind of vulnerable. He's always been like this anyway. He's always kind of, you know, him and Virgil always kind of, you know, really advocated for the saying stuff aloud and learning aloud, learning in public kind of thing. Um, kind of um, what they call it, uh, crowdsourcing opinions and all this sort of stuff, learning in real time. And the good thing about it is that generations to come will reap the rewards of this, right? They're the ones that are going to eat the fruits of all this struggling that he's going through. So um, all in all, it's going to be a good thing. Let's continue to the end of it. Well, media, you feel, is that more hurtful or beneficial to you? That's one of my favorite questions, this interview. I mean, we can use a car to rush somebody to the hospital or we could use a car and accidentally hit somebody while we're rushing somebody to the hospital. So it's all in how we use it. Do you have a future all right, Kanye. political aspirations? Yes, absolutely. All right, so that's basically Kanye. He's got political aspirations. He's said sorry to Kim and the family. Um, he says Sway was right in the end in terms of, you know, empowering himself to, you know, to make his own stuff and not relying on the middleman or the white man to basically make him successful. Um, and he's learned a lot. He's growing. He wants to uh, say so and the way his kids are raised and what schools they go to, blah, de, blah, blah. But it was a pretty decent interview nonetheless. I'm eager to see what the next evolution of Ye and Yeezy is going to be going forward. I am eager, 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 eager. Moving on. We have news here courtesy of Hypebeast regarding Swedish House Mafia's IKEA collaboration, which is pretty interesting, right? Because the first thing you'd say is, hmm, Swedish House Mafia doing an IKEA collaboration is obviously going to be DJ inspired. And clearly, judging from this image, it is. It kind of takes upon their new aesthetic they have going on at the moment, this kind of black thing. They've gone for a bit of a rebrand, it feels like, over the last few months, where they've kind of transitioned into being this sort of like noir, black sort of aesthetic based kind of group, which is weird, but hey. And it looks pretty cool, pretty interesting. I'm not that mad at it. The headline is Swedish House, Mafia, Swedish House Mafia's IKEA collab is designed for the foster creative pursuits. It says once 2020 credits roll, Swedish House Mafia will look back and say what a hell of a year the EDM supergroup. Imagine that. Imagine being regarded as an EDM supergroup. I'd cringe. That is so cringy. That's like calling yourself, or that's like saying aloud that you have a podcast, right? Or I'm a DJ, right? Or I'm a comedian. It's like, it's like gross. Keep that to yourself, brother. Um, anyway, it continues. Composers of Sebastian Ingrosso, Axwell, and Steve Angulo put on two electric um, headlining performances at uh, Coachella in conjunction with The weekend. dropped their solo uh, sorry, their debut studio album, Paradise Again, and are now embarking on a new endeavor, their own collection with IKEA. Very seldom do music artists and furniture design overlap, but Swedish South Mafia is a made match made in heaven and Sweden. Um, obviously, of course, makes sense there. Before, that's actually, I'm surprised they didn't get a collaboration sooner, to be honest, isn't it? Um, it says here, before they hit singles and hit it, oh, it's, it's going to be all this, what, what they're saying here. Um, growing up, we used a lot of IKEA furniture, made our own DJ tables and studio tables and speaker stands. With this collaboration, we wanted to essentially create our younger, what our younger selves would want it. This is kind of sounds like essentially what Virgil did with them, IKEA, innit? Um, and help people like our younger selves afford cool equipment as they dive into being a music producer. Um, the collection is titled Ob, what's that? Obegrandsdad, Obegrandsdad, which translates to unlimited in Swedish, which also a reflection of the purpose of the gear towards music fans, producers, DJs, and creators. Unlimited, okay, whatever. Uh, Swedish House Mafia, sorry, IKEA, Swedish roots, global reach, and affordable nature convinced Swedish House Mafia um, that they were the ideal partners. It says there's a big phenomenon to actually making music in your home, says lead de designer. <laughs> it's a big phenomenon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, people, it's needs, it's needs must, isn't it? You spend most of your time at home, so why not just make your music at home? Two years are expensive, so you do that. It's not a big phenomenon. <laughs> like, what? Anyway, um, we typically sit with the expertise um, of home furnishing knowledge, but we're not experts of how to make music or how to set up a functional music space. So that's where we helped each other and why the partnership was so perfect. So I'm going to put this picture to be big so I can see what it looks like. It looks like we've got a desk with some shelves in it so you can stick your flipping vinyl in it. We've got some chairs. Most of the chairs are included. That kind of setty thing. Oh, they are. Wow. The chairs are included. The chairs look fantastic, to be completely honest. The chairs look really good. There's also a turntable um, included in it. 
a good shelving unit. It looks like you could put some decks and some vinyl on there, a nice lamp, a good little stool that you can whip out. Um, what is that, do you reckon? I don't know what that is. It looks like a magazine rack, a speaker stand, I'm not too sure. And then obviously you've got a nice and massive desk as well that would be good to kind of have a PC on, um, a MIDI keyboard, whatever it may be. So yeah, it looks pretty sick. The collection amounts of 20 furnishing solutions, all of which are surrounded in all black to mirrored EDM's artist signature style, aesthetic with first and foremost this project followed by functionality and problem solving. I love that someone actually said that for once because you hear a lot of designers say, oh, no, um, functionality was the most thing we settled on and then what it looked like. No, you didn't. Most designers we know. I used to I, I used to go to the uh, design school, right? Um, I went to St. Mines. I studied product design. I know what it's about, bro. You always think about the aesthetic. Why would you be a designer if you didn't think about the aesthetic? You want things to look beautiful. That's why people redesign flipping irons and, you know, beer bottles and all this sort of stuff and benches and shit because you want to try and, you know, beautify the common, you know, the common object and, and kind of raise its level a little bit and allow people to maybe be inspired by your works and whatever it may be functionality my ass and it continues this is a project that we were we were very hands-on with in terms of testing and creating each product as opposed to being a collection that we slapped our name on or just to make money which i've done in the past i'm assuming because they brought it up um the three key items lead the range first the laid back armchair the, anyway let's just look at the pictures the pictures are more interesting so this is a picture showcasing the desk the chair and that's it really which looks amazing to be fair in a really light room the black and the whites really balance off each other really well. I'm not mad at that in the slightest. Um, there's a tote bag also, it looks like, which I'm not mad at. It's basically the same, you know, material that IKEA bag uses in general, but it's just shrouded in black with, does that look like, so it's just my fear signature? Yeah, it does maybe. There's signage on the straps as well. So that I'm a big fan of. I wonder if the house slippers are included too. Maybe, maybe not. There's a chair also included there. There's a wall light type of thing. There's a wall, there's a kind of LED box as well that looks pretty nice. The lamp looks really cool. There's some good stuff in here. I think this will do really well. I'm not gonna oh, I'm not gonna lie. As much as I was poo-pooing and and making jokes, I think this is gonna do really, really well. There's no denying that whatsoever. This is cool, man. Uh and it's also better, you know, than having kids just, you know, slapping toys all over their rooms. At least let make it look a little bit, you know, a little bit designed and grown up and whatnot. Um, this is gonna be what it's gonna be in stores when we don't know the date yet, no date of when it's going to be released, but regardless, check it out if you haven't already. Swish House Mafia with IKEA collab. It looks absolutely sick. To continue on with the Swedish House Mafia news, we've got some not, not, not so good news regarding the group. This is courtesy of Mixmag. Swedish House Mafia caused millions in equipment damage due to performing in the rain. This goes back to what I said per, prior about, you know, what is up with big name DJs? just being really detached from reality um lacking in self-awareness out of touch in general and just a little bit entitled and up there and ask like what's the deal what's going on here and you know the actions always speak louder than words so it continues here so Swedish Life Mafia reportedly caused million dollars of worth of damage after continuing to play live performance in the pouring rain as part of the Paris again US told the trio played live to a sold out crowd at the Bank of California Stadium in Los Angeles last week the largest outdoor tour the largest outdoor set of the tour so far it had been over a decade since Swedish Life Mafia had played in LA so obviously okay it's in LA they've they're they're feeling the vibe they invited all their friends out they're probably gonna go to what's those flipping what's that restaurant um that all the Jenners go to oh Mr. Nice Guys or something they're gonna go there after they're gonna hang around they're probably gonna do a bunch of blow or the some or some other things and just hang out so I can understand why they probably continue to play in it <laughs> It says the weather conditions that continued throughout almost the entirety of the set reportedly had their team pleading for them to stop playing. However, the trio continued the decision that was allegedly caused millions of dollars worth of damage to their equipment. Madness. But they make millions as well. Do you know what I mean? Individually themselves, right? They probably command a huge flipping DJ fee, right? High, 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 high figures. So they'll be all right. It says, according to sources at TMZ, millions of audio and stage equipment will need to be repaired or entirely replaced. Luckily, there's next show in Vancouver went ahead with no concerns correlate to the issues faced at LA set. During the San Francisco show, they dropped a brand new track and vocals for Alicia Keys. Duh, duh, duh. This is a video taken from it um, where they're playing. In yeah! Yo, they're playing in stadiums, right? Fucking hell, mate. DJ group playing in the stadium is fucking wild. 
and it looks packed as well. Hold a little bit, see what's going on here. And fast forward it more. It's a rain, oh yeah, it's like I see a little bit of rain specs here and there. Yeah, it looks looks like a fun show. I'm not going to lie. The lighting is fucking incredible, but that is absolutely rammed, isn't it? Look at that. Wall side no wall to wall. Wall to wall, wall, to wall figuratively speaking, but Jesus Christ, I stay packed out of that venue. God damn it. But yeah, I guess they caused million dollars worth of damage. They're probably gonna be able to cover that themselves anyway. But it's just funny, isn't it? Like the Usually you would imagine this sort of attitude when you're kind of playing somewhere and you're refusing to go off usually happens when you haven't played a lot. I know for me myself or you know when you're playing somewhere especially when you arrive late and you haven't played in a while and it's just a bummer you have to come off because you just you already got there and you wasted flipping 10 minutes trying to find a place and now you've got 10 minutes less to kind of perform your set and you just feel like oh can they give me a couple more minutes but obviously the person that was kind of play after you they came on time so you you know you don't really have any right to demand you eat into their time because you got there late or just in general if you had a longer set or just in general if you maybe had a set that was maybe longer but you wanted to kind of carry over into a person's hour you know, maybe it can happen because legitimately you had like a real dearth in flipping um, gigs overall like I've had and you're just desperate to play. That's one thing. But these guys are playing every weekend. They're playing every week, every day. If they wanted to, they'll be able to play. If they had the strength to do so or whatnot, they could probably play every single day. So there's no need to kind of hog the decks. There's no need to like refuse not to come off the stage. There's no need. But maybe in their defense, they could be like, no, we're here for fan service. These fans came out in the pouring rain to see us. Why shouldn't we perform in the pouring rain also if they're there? Do you know what I mean? There shouldn't be any difference in that. And maybe that was a good call on their behalf because you'd imagine that all those fans in there who are hardcore Swedish House Mafia fans, they'll probably be like, we're going to be your guys and fans forever because of what you did there. You didn't call off the show at the first sign of rain because it was all, you know, it was like a proper stadium, like, you know, they were at open air and whatnot, so no roof or nothing. And they continued the show. People clearly stayed because they continued also. That helped with the whole situation. So, Maybe it was a good call in terms of a fan service type of thing, but in terms of a DJ thing, it's fucking hilarious, right? Their team trying to pull them off, them just basically ignoring them and continuing to play. Absolutely brutal, <laughs> absolutely brutal. But big up Sushi House Mafia regardless. You know, they did their thing. They did their thing. Next I wanted to quickly mention was this. So it looks like the video um, for Kylie Minogue's Can't Get You Out Of My Head, uh, Peggy Goo Midnight Remix is out. And the one thing that I wanted to note about this, that I wanted to speak about, was the clear and obvious effects of a really, really busy and hectic DJ schedule. Um, the kind of temptations that come along with living a DJ lifestyle or a rock style lifestyle, the drugs, the drinking, the hedonism, the staying you know, up and ungodly hours, the traveling, um, the lack of sleep, all that stuff, right? Will obviously contribute to maybe people who DJ at the highest levels not looking their best, which is why we have to give people like Gerd Jansen a lot of props, right? That guy is looking looked like a mid 30s geography teacher for the last 10 plus decades right like he's like looked exactly the same um he doesn't look any older or any younger he just looked exactly the same and that's because for the most part the only thing he does drink when he's at a club is water and sometimes he doesn't even drink water i've just seen him play for hours and hours and not touch a sink a sip of liquids take off his jumper or whatnot and he also does looks like he doesn't sweat for some reason i don't know what that's about he doesn't sweat even though he looks like he's covered in hair all over his body pores or not it doesn't matter i'm going to continue but that's the only way to kind of i feel like um you know avoid the unpleasant side effects of a party lifestyle is just to kind of abstain but like i said the temptation from that is wild i know for myself even on my very very low level that i dj at the temptation to go out and pick up a little packet before you play and have that in your back pocket burning a hole so that when you finish a set you can you know dive on deep or you can do it during your set um the amount of free drinks you get um you know the amount of free drinks people buy you um the after parties you get invited to the social group around it all that stuff can just 
just lead to you going a bit crazy. But watching this video, boy, Jesus, it looks like that sort of stuff might have happened to Madame Peggy Goo because she looks a lot. Because again, I haven't really been paying attention to her since, you know, I obviously spoke about what happened with her and Daniel Wang, but I haven't really been seeing her on my social media. I don't really follow her or anything, so I don't really know what's going on. But she definitely looks different, right? She looks like, you know, a bit, obviously a bit older, a little bit more fuller in her cheeks, but you can maybe tell that she's, you know, she's had, she's lived a life. She's actually been out there doing her thing, touring around the world. And maybe we're now seeing the kind of effects of it in her face and whatnot. And, you know, it's probably not the greatest, but again, you know, maybe, you know, you have one shot at life um, and you're doing the thing that you actually enjoy. So maybe it actually is what you actually was wanting to do. And it doesn't matter if you end up having a few extra wrinkles, you end up looking a little bit tired, a little bit haggard. Maybe it's the way it should be always in it? this sort of lifestyle. But I think, I think, I wonder if there's going to be a, a sort of, um, what you it? Not, not progress. I wonder if there's going to be a turning of the leaf in that kind of turning of the leaf. Is that, that's not the right term. I wonder if there's going to be like an evolution in that because I know in kind of pop star world, like Kylie Minogue world, in terms of just general music, normie music world, there are artists who just treat music as a job. They go in the studio from nine to five, they perform their tours, they go back to their hotel rooms, they go back to their families, they don't have any alcohol on the rider, they just flip and drink green juices and do fucking yoga poses um, before they're set. They just treat it like a job and they look amazing and immaculate. But I think for the most part, in the DJ world side of things, it doesn't really feel like that's the vibe. I feel like every DJ on every level is getting on it in some way shape or form whether it's really excessive or it's really negative it's really low it's like and also there's no middle ground it's like they really get on it or they're completely sober because they had like a really bad incident like you know you think of somebody like a jack master for instance but there isn't a kind of just a balanced kind of approach or a balanced reasonable grown-up kind of approach to it but maybe again it's the nature of the business because it's nightlife which obviously you know attracts some unscrupulous characters and maybe brings out the worst in people and you know like most parents would say nothing good happens after 9 a.m or 9 p.m sorry so all that kind of stuff kind of affects it also but i don't know man i just i wonder if there's ever going to come a point where it just becomes like hey people play music behind these decks you go to dance in front of the decks on the dance floor and whatnot um and maybe shout you know and scream and do your thing but the idea that you have to go out and do drugs in order to enjoy the music maybe is going to go by the wayside and people are going to actually start to enjoy it for the music because as much as people like to say they're out for the music most people that do go to rave i know myself included it is a bit of escapism right you do kind of want to unplug from your daily scourges that you're going through and there's no better way to unplug than to kind of you know douse yourself or to kind of sink yourself in class a drugs but of course over the time it takes the effect on you and you end up looking a little bit more haggard than you would have liked to oh kind of look was fucking fantastic fantastic um but yeah overall the tune itself is absolutely terrible that goes that needs to be said um i i think i mentioned it before on twitter that generally i feel like all kylie minogue tracks like the the actual original tracks are good enough as they are to be played in clubs i know i've played them before in sets and they've gone completely off people gone crazy for them you don't even have to pitch them up or down they just work as is but for some reason the remixes never are quite right the same thing can be said for george michael um, there's not really great George Michael remixes out there. Um, there's obviously great Michael Jackson remixes and whatnot, but I feel like Kylie Minogue and George Michael's music is so good, you don't need to add a remix onto it. And I feel like this Midnight re this midnight Remix isn't good in the slightest, I don't think. It doesn't really lift the track anyway. It doesn't really do anything interesting to it. It doesn't necessarily move the needle. And maybe it kind of reflected in the views, which I was surprised by, right? It's uploaded on 22nd of September. It's only got 3,000 views, which is quite crazy considering the profile of the two of the people involved in terms of Kylie Minogue minogue and peggy goo but like i said um you know she looks a lot older maybe because she is older now maybe because she's you know growing into being an actual woman i'm not really too sure how old she is or whatever it may be but i do feel like you know we're seeing the effects of a real party lifestyle of being somebody that's really in demand that's touring all around the world and whatnot and i wonder if maybe we'll get to a point where this won't be the standard thing going on i wonder if that's going to be the case because it's not just you know on the on the flipping women's side of things it also affects the men and maybe the men even worse because i saw this picture um that was featured on uh kind of music crew the page that kind of music used for you know showing their crew stuff and it features adam port rampa and Ami. and in the middle there you see the one and only solomon and he looks rough 
right? And I'm a big fan of Solomon, right? I'm a big fan of the guy. Um, I think, you know, he is kind of much derided and whatnot. The whole after party meme is fucking hilarious. But I think him as a DJ, him as a producer, incredibly strong. Um, I think what he's done overall for the whole, I, for the whole, I think, GDA landscape in terms of, in, in the popular terms of stuff, not in, you know, underground sense of it, but in terms of educating the consumer into kind of um, being okay with going to see a DJ play for more than four hours, I think obviously he kind of popularized it because he does kind of you know marathon eight hour sets 10 hour sets and whatnot and i think normie crowds sometimes aren't necessarily super down for it they want to see a lineup full of like you know hard hitting people you know seven different big high profile djs playing one hour sets each bang 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 but you know solomon kind of popularized i feel like that kind of um og berlin sort of style of djing the old kind of new york um loft kind of thing that used to happen in the 70s 80s where a person would play for the entirety of the night and kind of you know um really sort of provide the soundtrack for your night and really kind of take you on a quote-unquote journey and i guess and i would say in my opinion he kind of popularized that for normies but obviously this guy isn't afraid of a cigarette he isn't afraid of a glass of wine um, there's probably a plate of food he's never said no to and he's slowly but surely turning into the Serbian eats everything right <laughs> he really is especially when you can t especially when you compare him to the other guys in this group especially Adam Port and Ami who are both I think I think Adam Port is definitely sober because I'm sure he's straight edge but these two guys are usually quite fresh faced they're usually eating fruits and other bits and pieces behind the decks and keeping themselves fed and whatnot and hydrated and Ami's probably the only one that's maybe a party kid and he may Maybe looks more similar to you know Solomon. He actually looks like he could be Solomon's kid here, isn't it? I mean, I'm sorry, Ramfa, right? He looks like he could be Solomon's actual child. He's got a nice civilist um, um, knit here, you know, one of the best skate shops out there in Berlin. So big up civilist, but he looks like he could be flipping Solomon's flipping child. But yeah, Solomon looks really haggard. You can see in his fucking fingers, he's got the fucking prince. Um, what you call it prince charles flipping fingers there going on um there's a lot of red wine that's probably you know spiraling throughout his body maybe some champagne he hasn't got the trademark glasses on so you can definitely see the entirety of his face and yeah he looks like he's seen some things and like i said um maybe it's not we don't get to a point where we're kind of completely completely sober like how adam paul is in terms of you don't do absolutely anything and the most you have is like sparkling water behind the decks because i feel like you know Personally, I feel like that's, pun that's a punishment. Going to a party, a rave, with sweaty, drunk, high people, and all you're drinking is fucking San Pellegrino and whatnot, seems like, to me, like an absolute horrible occasion, horrible time. Why would you do that to yourself? But it also is good that these people exist because it proves that you can have fun nights out without always getting on it, um, which is a good thing. But, uh, you know when you do try to get on it and have some fun you also have to be aware that the end of the road always kind of ends it like this you don't end up looking fresh face when you just you know you pick up flipping you know eight balls every other weekend and you're going and you're doing half the parties all the way until monday before you get to work you're calling in sick all the time like you just can't it just doesn't end well for you um in general but yeah solomon's looking quite haggard um so is peggy goo it looks like for the most part and it seems like um we're now seeing the actual effects of what it is to be a real high high level dj and you know if you're up there and you're trying to search for that kind of stuff maybe it's a it's a sort of a caution word of caution that you know maybe the thing that you're searching for and want isn't necessarily what you actually want because this is what those guys are doing they're playing every weekend at all the best parties and all the best clubs in the world and you know essentially when you give into your vices and you give into the temptation and you just start enjoying yourself it does end this way because he kind of looks like a a dj version of burt kreischer in it that's what it sort of looks like right solomon he's like burt kreischer but in dj form It'd be funny if he does decide one point to just change the way he DJs and just start taking his shirt off behind the booth. It'll probably increase his fucking in the amount of gigs he gets. Maybe he can bump up his fucking fee as well. That's how mad um, the whole DJing world is. But yeah, uh, big up Peggy Goo, big up Solomon. Uh, check out the Peggy Goo and Kylie Jenner track if you want to. So Kylie Jenner, Kylie Minogue track, but um, it's not for me. Next, we have this one. This is flipping hilarious so i think most of you guys are aware who what one whack 100 is right 
and obviously he's a um, games manager and just a very influential figure in the LA um, hip hop side of things but he's also been prominent nowadays for his kind of you know um, goon gangster hood gang talk stuff that he's been doing in terms of you know talking to various other ex-gang members or participating gang members on stuff like Clubhouse and talking about topics concerning you know stuff that's happened in the news maybe someone got shot maybe someone got robbed maybe someone got in a fight and he's somebody that kind of always offers a sort of like OG point of it point of view because he's kind of been there been through the wars done everything it may be but we've never seen him in this way but I think the most important no, the most funny side of the, obviously Wack has been him on Clubhouse him shouting at people um, because he feels like they disrespected him or just shouting at them because he just wants to shout and he's kind of turned into a bit of a weird hip hop villain for the most part but he's also kind of known as somebody that's ready to fight and get down at any point right any sign of disrespect he wants to get down he wants to fight and he wants to get on it <laughs> So it's even funnier when you do then end up seeing a picture of him like this, right? All stark as again, the picture's been blurred out, thankfully, so hopefully I don't get taken off of YouTube for it. But he's essentially stark naked, um, laying on his flipping belly um, on Clubhouse which is absolutely hilarious. So all those times that he's been shouting at goons on Clubhouse and raging about this topic and, you know, talking down upon people and trying to bully people through the medium of Clubhouse and just be an absolute dick, no pun intended. He's actually been lying on his belly, swinging his legs around with his butt out in the air, screaming at people, stark naked, like stark, stark naked, which is hilarious. So let's play a little bit of the clip of it and you can hear um, WAC 100 on the phone talking to on Clubhouse while the person behind him records this quick clip. Humbly and peacefully, I want you to answer this question. Did you not call my phone humbly and peacefully? I know it was you. 4 a.m. I answered the phone. I said, who the fuck is this? Say it's posted. I said different name coming up on <laughs> hilarious, isn't it? So allegedly the person that posted it was um his masseuse who he's now, you know, got into a little bit of an affair with, I guess, which is obviously, you know, treachy because I'm sure he's married and stuff, so that's obviously not the best thing. And I think they, they were go they're going through some sort of beef where he's basically pretending he doesn't know who she is or something, and I guess she went to have some get back and then she basically released this video that she took and it makes sense though because he's obviously comfortable as funny as it is he's clearly comfy you don't just lie on a bed butt naked with your ass out in the air talking on clubhouse if you're not comfortable with the person that you're with and clearly it looks like they're in some sort of hotel room but it's just hilarious it's just absolutely hilarious that this goon this guy this flipping gangster this pyru would be on clubhouse stark naked shouting at people so all those times that he's been you know raging on the phone just think about it he's been naked the whole time and i know some people do that i know some people love to sleep naked and stuff and whatnot which i've always found bizarre especially when there's other people in the room it's fucking some voyeuristic creep shit but it's just hilarious to see the image the mental image of him you know face down but up shouting at people on clubhouse shouting at people on twitter shouting at people on ig live and just shouting in general whilst he's completely bass naked and i've read somewhere that he's now striking down channels so he might actually get, attack me but i know he's just striking down channels or he's sending people messages to take videos down and whatnot and he's getting lawyers involved and what but i think in this occasion you just have to kind of chalk it up as an l laugh at yourself and move on you know involving lawyers and stuff and really trying to kind of you know um cancel people not cancel people but you know you know what i mean go that extra mile is really really unnecessary it's obviously an issue that he's had with whoever's involved he's involved in it's kind of their direct issue obviously she's made it everyone's issue by kind of popularizing it and putting it out there but you don't need to be going out there trying to cancel people and whatnot. I mean, that's a bit weird, I think, going forward. But hey, what do I know? What do I know? So let's move on from that and talk about... Um, let's talk about this. So this is courtesy of Hypebeast, it says as follows, it says here, new Yeezy Gap engineered by Balenciaga Collection is set to launch globally featuring round jackets, shrunken hoodies, light parkas, fleeces, jogger pants, cross, cod, cross, cody, cross body bags. Now, say what you want about Kanye and, you know, he's been annoying with his whole flipping ranting and raving about these issues he's been having with bloody um, Gap and whatnot, Adidas and everything else. But it is quite ironic isn't it? and funny that 
just after he was raging everybody, releasing DLs, putting people's pictures up on his Instagram, and just, you know, going on off on one, now suddenly the whole collection is coming out. Right now, suddenly they're ramping up the flipping um, imagery. They're ramping up the rollout and um, merchandising, whatever it may be. It's just interesting that. So I wonder if this is something that was already in the pipeline, or is it something that's tied to the fact that the deal's now been terminated? So just kind of rushing to get it all out um, because maybe it was all made before and it was all going to stagger the releases, or if this is directly influenced by you know Kanye basically acting out and ranting online. Either way, I'm. I'm happy that I get to see all all of it and see the looks and see the vision they're kind of going for. And the first thing I'm struck by, the first thing that I think needs to be given Kanye some props for, is his ability to create silhouettes, um, color color palettes, and tones, whatever it may be, that set the trend going forward because you have to imagine when the first Yeezy collection dropped and it was all those browns and greens and you had jumpers with holes in them and stuff there were many a brands out there who essentially had built their entire fashion brand off of the back of Kanye's first couple of collections what he did for Yeezy right especially with the models all standing around and stuff right those all those all those kind of um uh skin toned uh, underwear pieces and stuff and jumpsuits and whatnot and leggings and tights and shit those are all the things that you saw other brands kind of incorporate in their overall collection so now so many years later he's now decided to flip it on its head and do loads of blacks and greys and granites and whatnot and change the materials of it also and there's not i don't know it looks you know there's loads of shiny stuff there's not a lot of you know you say classic cottony type stuff that you'd maybe use in the first type of few collections again i haven't touched any stuff so i don't know what it eventually looks like um you know the anon the anonymity the anonym anonymity of it and an anonymity of it so anonymity anonymity of it all all the models cover faces are covered and whatnot like obviously stuff that's been happening with demna at balenciaga and then further back with um maison martian margilla back in the day but he has to give him credit for it for being able to create these sort of like what do you call it these avatars of what he views fashion to be right what he's what his kind of fashion uniform is what his kind of ideal man or woman looks like whatever it may be what the ideal wardrobe is for him you have to give him credit for it i think it looks absolutely amazing not gonna lie those boots are pretty cool in the first slide also in that parka but i'm really interested in these boots here so he's got these sort of rain mud boots that you see in kanye wear you know he's got his own iterations that he's obviously worn from other companies but i think these are maybe stuff that have been made with maybe easy gap in mind but i haven't seen any any mention of these so far some nice gray jeans obviously the hoodie that everyone's been raving with the nice little gap logo there and this backpack too it looks absolutely amazing too it looks like the kind of backpack that's meant to kind of flow in water or that's waterproof completely that you can obviously use as a boy if you're kind of you know drowning somewhere um, and then again, you've got some great t-shirts here, you've got a crossbody bag, you've got those big knee-high boots that look pretty decent as well. Um, you've got another image here with the parka, um, with the crossbody, or what's that, what would you call that? You call that more of a, what's, what's that thing called again? Bum bag or whatnot as well, around the waist. The styling is really good, I'm not going to lie, I always love the image in the photography. It was pretty sick, I'm not going to lie. I love these high, these knee-high or fire high boots as well they look very uncomfortable very gangly but really cool i love the fact that these boots are unisex because i saw a picture of um of uh lucas Saba actually wearing the whole look with the whole um actually he might have had the high heel boots on the little stiletto heel but these look pretty sick as well i'm not going to lie you got this great um gray sort of tracksuit going on as well with this funnel neck which i'm a big fan of you don't really see a lot of that actually that's surprisingly a thing that doesn't really get made that often um sweatshirts with the kangaroo pocket but with a funnel neck so instead of having a hood you've got just kind of this wide kind of relaxed neck fit which i kind of like because it's you know it's probably a little bit better than wearing a sweatshirt but if you don't want to have the hood and have that fucking you around you've got this nice funnel neck that you can kind of cover your mouth with or if you want to ventilate yourself a little bit you can open up a bit too but I love the look of that. I'm not going to lie. Um, of course, it's good to have the hems always dragging along the floor so it can all get chewed up so people can see that you're not really about this life. From the back, with all that wear and tear, there's obviously addition of the jean suit, which I'm always a good, a, you know, big fan of. Um, it's got here padded shoulders, it looks like. 
um, I think it's the same jeans suit that Kanye wore actually at the war ceremony. No, sorry, when he went to the fashion show with Julia Fox that time back in the day. And then also it's featured, I think, in the cover for Quavo and what's his name? And Takeoff's um, single recently, or maybe even album. And I think they're both wearing the same jean suit also, which looks pretty sick. And again, the pictures are done really well also. Again, I'm curious to see if those boots will end up coming out. I really, really am. This jumpsuit looks amazing. Pure serial killer vibes. It looks like some sort of um, over-dyed uh, cotton material, brush cotton, I'm not really too sure. Um, jumpsuit with some nice zip pockets on the side, some pockets here on the front of the chest and also a hood. So it looks pretty sick. And also the addition of the rain boots or the knee-high boots. Hopefully those are also included in the collection. You've got obviously the same jumpsuit again. Got a crossbody bag. You've got an anorak. Oh no, you got a parka here. That's not an anorak. Oh, that jacket's really nice. That's probably my favorite jacket of them all. That's an incredibly nice jacket. Um, it's basically a, a, a parka, you'd say, maybe without the hood. Maybe there's a concealed hood on the inside. It looks really nice. Everything's kind of, everything's sort of like behind the flap or behind a closure. There is no exposed sort of zips or anything on this jacket also, which I'm a big fan of. It sort of makes it look seamless, which it obviously isn't. Um, and again, you've got the Kanye, it got to the Yeezy Gap Dove hoodie as well, which I'm a big fan of visually. Oh, this is a good, it looks like awesome. I want to take the pictures. You've got this sort of like a down, what would you call that? You call that a down jacket, a down anorak? maybe i'm really sure with the backpack there behind it also nice trousers and the boots featured again hopefully the boots are for sale i'm gonna read the article now to see but i really hope the boots are for sale you got the round jacket it looks really cool in this look as well it looks fucking banging all of it and the hat as well so all of it i'm a big fan see the article and see what they say when's it meant to come out so the collection is now available what is it saying and globally online will be dropping in similar stores in the u.s and gap flagship stores okay cool so let's see they said it's all available on Yeezy Gap. Let's see if the boots are available. I want to see how much they are going for. Um, the, 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 we're on the Yeezy Gap website right now. It's loading because my computer is horrible. And here's the latest stuff we've got going. Okay, got a cargo, you've got a round jacket. Um, you've got the logo Sean Cody. Or oh, the, the dry bag. That's what it's called. It's called a dry bag. Those things. It's 240 Chase, it's a lot of money in it. Um, you've got the crossbody bag, you've got the padded anorak. Oh, it's a padded anorak. Okay, it's not a down. Well, it's the down is definitely padded, right? I'm assuming. Let's click it. Is down padded or is padded down? Not really too sure. Let's see what it says the info. Adjustable bungee at the hood, wrist and hem, 100 line loan, uh, primal loft, polyester feel, water resistant. So, yeah, it's not really down filled in there at all. It's just padded. So, it makes sense that it's correct in the description there. I am wrong. Um, you've got a coated, um, co co sorry, a coated cotton anorak, which is really nice. The finish looks on that really beautiful. You've got a coated cotton overalls. You've got the snake bag, which I really like. Aesthetically looking wise, it looks fucking cool as hell. Um, I'm surprised I haven't seen more people out and about with it, wearing it. It's sort of like a really thin you know, snake looking bag that's got these really nice hidden little pockets at the back and the front and whatnot. It just looks really nice. You could easily kind of carry it if you just want to have your phone and anything else that's a, you know, a cylindrical sort of like straight shape, you know what I mean? But it does look really cool. I'm a big fan of that bag. My feel looks nuts. Let's continue on and see what else they've got here. Hoodies again. They've got a keychain. They've got hats available. I wonder, I'm really curious to want to know if the addition of the Gap logo in black and white, but with the Gap words in white, I wonder if this was a stipulation that they had in the contract Gap, like under no circumstances, do you, would you can you take that off? Like that has to be prominently on display on one part of the garment. I know in the, the park is not the case. Oh, it is the case actually, the park is, yeah, they've both got the logo on it. I was just about to say, I just nearly kicked myself in the foot there. So that has it, but it doesn't look like the padded anorak has the logo in the front. I think the brush cotton one or whatever, that cotton or other one has it, but not the anorak, which is interesting to say the least. Anyways, continue on. Let's see if they got the shoes. I'm still taking my time here, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Got the hat, got the long sleeve, got the keychain. I've got a vest here. Um, oh, they've got the coated light parka that I like. That's 350. And that's it, yeah. No boots. So you don't see the boots. Whatever those boots were, 
um, aren't going to be out, it looks like, unfortunately. Let's see what people are saying here in the comments about sitting to the boots. Nothing about the boots. Let's see. Yeah, no one's talking about the boots. Only me. Only I care about the boots. But I do think they look sick, personally. And I hope they do eventually come out because I like the way they look and I like the way they look. No? Or am I, or am I alone in these? Maybe I'm alone. Maybe I'm alone. Born alone, die alone. Who knows? But yeah. Yeezy Gap, Engineer by Balenciaga, out now at all your Yeezy Gap retailers or specifically yeezygap.com. Check it out if you're interested. Check it out if you're interested. Anyway, that is 6.03 of the Exxon Zinga Show. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. But a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time, check out the show. You know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, share with your friends. And if you didn't like it, then also press on like. If you want to leave me a review, that'd be greatly appreciated. Also, you could do that on all the, you know, podcast and streaming platforms that you use such as apple and spotify they have the ability to leave star ratings or reviews do whatever you want to do on those ones any review at all is much appreciated even if it's a bad one i do not care and yeah that's basically it nothing else to talk about there but i'll see you guys hopefully next week um for the meantime as like i said before i'm going to rave later today i'm also going to hopefully record a little vlog about my experience obviously you can't record inside a fold but i'll try my best to record some audio clips and i'll be back at you guys on the other side very very soon but until then take care be safe and all that malarkey and i'll see you guys again soon peace